Today, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. I have in my hands an antique Fusé pocket watch in a sterling silver case. And if I'm being honest, it scares the living daylights out of me. The owner of the watch would like it running again, but expectations were low. Just how old is this watch anyway? The hallmark stamped into the silver provides some hints. The lower hallmark is the case maker's mark, usually a name, logo, or initials. The lion passant is the standard mark and is what indicates the silver fineness was certified by a London or other British assay office. The mark of origin indicates the specific assay office that certified the silver. For this case, the sword erected between three wheat sheaves indicates Chester. And finally, each office used its own date lettering schema. Knowing that the silver was certified by the Chester office, this style of N indicates the case was certified in 1876. I can only guess the movement was produced around that same time frame. Normally, these fusee movements are hinged at the top, but the pin is missing so it just came right out. There's a dust cover protecting the internals, which can be removed by releasing the lock by shifting this lever. The movement is marked by its maker, William K. of Doncaster, England. According to public records, the gentleman was born in a nearby suburb within the county of Yorkshire in 1845, and perhaps moved back to his mother's nearby hometown of Doncaster, where she was born in 1813, to pursue a career in watchmaking. So what exactly is a fusée-powered movement? The short answer is it is a system employed by early timekeeping devices to deliver constant power to the train of wheels as a way to improve isochronism. The fusée fine-tunes the power delivery to account for the imperfections and variability in component manufacturing. The fusée itself is a conical-shaped pulley attached by a chain to the mainspring barrel and serves as the first wheel in the train. It's common to associate the fusee with early keywind pocket watches, but the system was actually in use long before timekeeping was portable. When the movement is fully wound up, the chain, which is small enough to fit nicely on a rodent-sized bicycle, is wrapped completely around all layers of the fusee cone. The smaller diameter sections of the cone are employed when the mainspring is at its strongest. As the watch runs down, larger diameter sections of the cone release the chain compensating for a decrease in power output of the mainspring. The cone itself is built specifically to work with the unique dynamics of the mainspring, so replacing the mainspring means modifying or replacing the cone as well. The chain is also extremely delicate, and snapping one of these while the movement is fully wound would be catastrophic, so the stakes are pretty high when working on one of these. Eventually, advancements in manufacturing rendered the fusée obsolete with the introduction of the going train, which allowed the mainspring and barrel to directly drive the train of wheels with reasonably consistent power delivery. As you can see on this movement, the chain is fully wrapped around the cone, meaning I will need to let down the power before disassembling the train. Screws of this size were not mass produced at this time, so it was common to fix the plates together using these brass pins, some of which are missing, but I'll get to that later. The dial is also secured to the plate using brass pins that are inserted through the feet. Hmm, major issue number one. The extended fourth wheel pivot is missing. Not uncommon on any movement, it's easy to snap off this pivot if carelessly fitting or removing the second's hand. A watch of this era could have used spade or fleur-de-lis style hands. Hopefully I can find a new set that works. This movement uses what's called an undersprung balance. The cock is simply lifted away. Though quite dirty, the jewels actually look healthy. On undersprung balances, the hairspring is mounted below the arms of the wheel. The tail of the hairspring is pinned through the stud that is seemingly fixed to the plate. 
Rather than try to pry it out and risk damaging something, I simply remove the pin to free up the hairspring for removal. I know I'll have to deal with the repercussions of doing this later. No shortage of cobwebs on this balance, and aside from some dried up oil, these pivots look serviceable. Unlike American pocket watch companies who kept stellar factory records, it's highly unlikely I'll be able to find replacement parts for this watch. Aside from perhaps the hands and the crystal, I'll need to make everything myself. I will now pull out the brass pins to remove the dial, taking note which pins went where, and if there are any missing pins I'll need to make later. The carcass of the original hour hand is removed. The dial washer, hour wheel, minute wheel, and cannon pinions are uninstalled. Notice how the third wheel is exposed through this cutout on the plate. There's a very specific process to let down the main spring on a fusee, and is one of the scariest parts of the job. Step 1. Find a key that fits the winding square at the top of the fusee cone, and mount it vertically into something sturdy. Step 2. I'm just slightly loosening the screws of the bridge before I then lower the movement onto the key. While grasping the movement securely, I go ahead and remove the bridge and set it aside. Any slip up here would be catastrophic. I gently lift out the third wheel while I use my left hand to hold back the power of the spring. Step 4. Using my hands, I can now allow the spring to unwind itself in a controlled and deliberate manner. The chain is slowly winding off the fusee cone and onto the barrel. As you can see, all power is now let down and the next step is to remove the hook of the chain from the cone. The barrel bridge is now removed. I can now remove each of the brass pins securing the top plate to the pillars, again keeping track of which goes where, and taking note of which pillars are missing their pins. With the top plate lifted away, I can begin to remove the train of wheels beginning with the barrel, taking care to allow the chain to unhook itself. Can you just imagine how much time it took these watchmakers to craft these little individual links and pins by hand? But one other thing, and this probably doesn't really matter, but I noticed the chain was hooked backwards compared to the other fusees I've seen. The hook with the barbed end is normally on the barrel and the rounded end on the cone. I plan to reinstall the chain in this way.
Now I can remove the fusée cone, fourth wheel, escape wheel, pallet fork, and center wheel. I'm uninstalling the setup click and its ratcheting wheel. This is not to be confused with a winding click and ratchet wheel, and I'll demonstrate its purpose later. I'm now removing the sustaining power detent, the spring for which is attached to the other plate. Check out this cap jewel setting, apparently inspired by the gold bars from Fort Knox. It's just friction fit in the slot. Plenty of dirt and grime, but it looks okay. The fusée cone has internal components that will need to be cleaned as part of the service. There's a small retaining pin that needs to be removed before it can be pulled apart. There is a pair of internal clicks, completely gummed up by old grease. But here's a problem. The tip of one of the clicks is broken off, possibly due to being forced the wrong way. That will need to be replaced as I don't want all the load riding on a single point of failure. The spring in the lower layer of the cone is the sustaining spring. In combination with the sustaining detent, it applies driving force from its spring while the watch is being wound. The barrel lid is removed, exposing the arbor and the mainspring, which is one of the tallest mainsprings I have ever seen. When it comes to caked on oil, the pre-cleaning ritual is critical. I carefully scrub all the pivot holes with pegwood prior to washing all the components in the cleaning machine. This way, I'll have the best chance of success in maximizing the performance this watch is still willing to give. The cap jewel on the balance cock is removed for cleaning as well. It too is quite filthy and will get the full treatment. As I mentioned earlier, the fourth wheel pivot of this movement is broken off. Or is it? It's anybody's guess what this teeny tiny pivot is doing here. Its diameter is certainly too small for the hole, and while I see a fair amount of corrosion, I don't know if that alone could have worn it down to a tiny nub just like this. It almost seems as if someone plugged it with a small pivot. 
In any case, I'll need to repivot this properly and to the correct length to accept the subseconds hand. No turning back now. The lower pivot fit the top hole quite nicely and I can safely assume the top pivot should have been that diameter. Before going any further, I intend to remediate the small bit of rust on the surface of the pinion leaves by soaking the wheel in evaporust and then polishing the surface with cerium oxide. 20 minutes later. With the pinion in good shape again, I can proceed with the repivoting job. I'll admit, I am not a professional nor an expert in any of this and I'm still trying to perfect the process of repivoting. But at a high level, the first step is to turn a small center into the face of the work. Once that is done, I use a carbide drill bit to hand drill the hole approximately three times deeper than the width of the pivot. I then select a rod of blued pivot steel and turn it down to size just enough to have it friction fit inside the hole. I'm using a cross slide to be absolutely certain that the part of the pivot that gets inserted into the hole is cylindrical and not tapered to eliminate the possibility of it wobbling out. I test fit the piece with the hole and incrementally remove more material as needed. Once I'm satisfied with that end, I'll part off the work and then turn it around to work on the extended pivot end. I'll now use the hand graver to turn it until it's between 0.01 to 0.02 millimeters larger than the target size as determined earlier. The pivot is turned around again so the wheel can finally be pressed on. I'm using the tailstock to help keep everything straight as I apply even pressure. Finally, the surface of the pivot will need to be smoothed over and work hardened on the jacket lathe. It is during this process I expect to remove the remainder of the 0.01 to 0.02 millimeters of the diameter using the burnisher. And now a quick test for end shake, side shake, and freedom of movement. The pre-cleaning ritual continues using a combination of nylon and fiberglass scratch brushes.
I'll now work on removing the remaining bits and pieces still attached to the main plate, starting with the maintaining detent spring. This is the spring that presses on the case latch lever. And now I remove the case latch lever. The case hinge piece is removed too, but I probably could have just left it on. I'm now removing part of the fuse cone stop works. In combination with the steel nose on top of the cone itself, this helps safely prevent overwinding the watch. If you recall, one of the internal clicks of the fuse cone is broken. I found another fuse cone online, and luckily its internal clicks were about the same size as the one I needed to replace. Of course, for reasons mentioned earlier, I couldn't just swap the cone itself as the layers were actually quite different, having been designed for another mainspring. Fortunately, this saved me a great deal of time or I would have had to file my own click out of a steel plate. Considering how tall the mainspring is, I did end up winding it in by hand. I'm not sure there are any winders out there that would support such a height. The mainspring and arbor hole are lubricated with Mobius D5. The arbor is lubricated with D5 before I reinstall the barrel lid. The upper balance hole jewel is inspected before the cap jewel is reinstalled.
I apply the precise amount of lubrication with the help of the Bergen 1A automatic oiler. The lower balance capsule setting is now slid into place. I can now lubricate the lower balance jewel with the automatic oiler. The fuse cone is now being reassembled. A small amount of lubrication is applied to the surface of the wheel where the spring would slide against. D5 is also applied to the surface of the spring where the next layer of the cone will move along. By the way, it kills me to have not noticed that small hair until now. I place a small amount of Mollycoat DX grease to the tips of the clicks before the upper section of the cone is reinstalled. Finally, the retaining pin is reinstalled through the arbor. Here, I'm now testing for freedom within the cone to ensure the assembly isn't excessively tight. This can happen if the retaining pin is oversized or was reinstalled in the wrong orientation. Reassembly of the rest of the movement begins generally in reverse order, starting with the stopworks lever. It is hinged to the plate using a brass pin. As the movement approaches full wind, the chain nears the top of the fusee cone and rides against this lever, which is then pressed up and in the way of the stopworks nose on the top of the cone, thereby preventing further winding rotations of the fusee. The tension spring for the lever is now installed. The movement hinge is being fitted back onto the main plate. I am now fitting the case latch back onto the main plate. The case latch spring is now installed. I noticed the latch screw was too tight and I had to back it off a partial turn to allow the spring to actuate it. I'm not too concerned with the screw loosening up all the way and falling out, since the dial would be in the way, but I decided to add a touch of thread locker to be sure it stays put anyway. I'm now fitting the sustaining detent spring to the other side of the main plate. And now the sustaining detent can be lowered into its pivot hole. A touch of Mobius 9010 lubricates the hole where the center wheel arbor will rotate. The fusee cone is situated, keeping in mind its lower hole is on the small plate that is yet to be installed on the dial side. The detent is moved so that it rests against the steel teeth of the sustaining wheel. The fourth wheel is lowered into its approximate position. The escape wheel is now fitted to the plate. 
I screwed up. I seem to have lost a banking pin. I went back to review earlier footage, thinking I may have carelessly knocked it out with the brushing, but it was already gone by the time I started with that. Actually, it happened prior to that and I failed to notice when it was already loose. This is not a showstopper. I was able to file down a small brass rod to a taper to friction fit into the hole. It's okay to make mistakes, what's important is turning the mistake into a learning opportunity and to remember that when we fail, we fail forward. The pallet jewel faces are each lubricated with a droplet of Mobius 941. I use the same technique to install the pallet fork as any other full plate movement. The fork is held onto the top plate with a piece of Rodico, and the plate is then lowered down onto the pillars of the main plate. With the exception of the fourth wheel pivot and the lower fusée cone arbor, I'll ensure all pivots are seated before proceeding. I'm using the lathe and a file to quickly make several brass pins to replace those that are missing from the movement. Each pin is reinstalled through their respective pillars to secure the top plate to the movement. Now I'm preparing to install the fusée chain. I will first temporarily fit the third and fourth wheel plate on the dial side of the movement. I need freedom to turn the cone so the third wheel is not fitted at this time. I'm taking extra care not to snap the brand new fourth wheel pivot. It's likely the sustaining detent needs to be resituated, so I'll take care of that first. Mobius D5 lubricates the hole in the plate where the barrel arbor will turn. D5 also lubricates the top of the arbor that will turn in the hole of the barrel bridge. I'm now installing the setup click. The regulator is now fitted onto the plate. I also install this little brass guard which friction fits over the fusée cone's winding square. This rounded hook will be attached to the fusée cone and the barbed hook will be attached to the mainspring barrel. The fusée cone has a little cutout with a pin on which the hook of the chain will attach. The barrel has a small hole drilled at an angle into its side where the other end of the chain will attach. Now for the chain. It was cleaned in an ultrasonic and then lightly oiled with a film of D5. I'm carefully fishing the chain through the movement behind the pillars, pulling through the excess until I can hook the barrel end.
Using a small key, I take up the excess back into the barrel, trying my best to avoid the chain from rolling on top of itself. With the majority of the chain on the barrel, I can now hook the fuse end of the chain onto the cone. And I continue to take up the excess until I feel pressure. With the setup ratchet in place, I'll now push through that pressure which actually engages the main spring. I'll turn the ratchet by a few teeth and then press the click to prevent it from returning. This essentially preloads the main spring to provide constant tension to the fusée chain with the movement fully run down. Doing so prevents any slack from developing in the chain which may cause it to shift around or unhook itself. With the chain installed, I can now remove the pivot plate from the dial side to prepare for the third wheel, trying to be careful with the new fourth wheel pivot. This has been quite the process. Can you imagine how excited watchmakers were when this whole fusée system was eventually replaced with the going train? But believe it or not, the fusée and chain transmission is making a comeback, for example, in some modern wristwatches designed by a Long and Zona. Once again, ensuring this detent is resting against the steel teeth of the sustaining ratchet wheel. The winding key is turned counterclockwise, slowly, and using very light fingers. Any resistance encountered at this point should not be fought, or the chain will break. What may happen is the chain might skip onto the next layer prematurely. If this happens, then the organization of the chain around the barrel needs to be reworked for proper alignment. Otherwise, the chain is pretty good about finding its path. The fusée cone arbor is lubricated with D5. All other train wheel pivots are lubricated with 9010. I'm now trying to fish the hairspring through the hole in the stud, approximating how much excess was pulled through before disassembly. The brass pin is returned to secure it in place. The balance cock is now reinstalled. My favorite moment of any watch repair is watching the balance spring to life for the first time. The cannon pinion is now reinstalled.
The minute and hour wheels are now reinstalled. The dial washer is placed over the hour wheel and now the dial can be lowered into place. Brass pins are inserted into the dial feet to secure it to the movement. This second's hand is suffering from surface corrosion and is missing the pipe that would secure it to the fourth wheel pivot. I welcome the challenge. First, I use 2000 grit sandpaper to remove the corrosion and finish the surface. After thoroughly cleaning the hand, it's flame blued over a bed of brass filings, heated underneath by a torch. And now, I select the small brass rod that's to be used for the pipe. There's a small shoulder that's turned into the top that allows the pipe to protrude through the hole in the hand. I am now turning a small center to prepare for drilling the hole. I'm hand drilling the hole and when I'm done I can part off the piece and move to the staking set to rivet it to the hand. A couple gentle taps from the hammer above expands the brass enough to secure it to the hand. The dust cover is now reinstalled. Upon installing the movement into the case, I can use this small brass pin I made to serve as the hinge point. The second's hand is now installed. The replacement hour hand wasn't exactly a great fit. It wants to go on, but it's just a fraction of a hair too small. To broach the hole, I first secure the hand in this small vise used for this very purpose. The vise clamps down onto the hand, which provides a safe platform to insert a broaching tool.
I insert a small cutting brooch held with a pin vise and gently twist it within the hole of the hour hand. I actually repeated this process several times until the hour hand had a nice snug but not overly tight fit onto the hour wheel. The minute hand fit nicely with no modifications needed. As is the process for any key set movement, I just lightly place it over the cannon pinion so I can align it to 12 before removing it to press on the hour hand. Finally, the minute hand is returned to the post and I snug it up with the help of the key. Now, if you're wondering what kind of time grapher reading I got from this fuse, I'm sorry to say you'll be disappointed. I spent a lot of time double and triple checking things for alignment, especially the hairspring, but I just can't get a clean reading. I'm not sure if this is normal with fuses, as there could be more creaks and noises than a more modern movement, or perhaps I didn't do a good job and I need to gain a bit more skill to truly diagnose what could be going on. In any case, I felt it was important to share this result for the sake of transparency. As an alternative to the time grapher, I'm going to regulate it the old-fashioned way, against a recently serviced Omega Seamaster chronometer, which you'll get to see in a future video. Over the course of 5 hours, the fuse I lost 7 seconds, meaning its effective rate is a loss of around 34 seconds per day. This was taken toward the middle of the wind. After some experimentation, I also discovered it runs at 250 seconds fast per day in the first 1 hour after a full wind. By 2 hours, it runs at 24 seconds fast per day. From hour 3, it declined linearly until hovering around 30 to 35 seconds slow per day and then eventually settling into a loss of 48 seconds per day in the final hour of power. I admit, I did not repeat this for every single position, but I will say that vertical positions were a little worse, which is to be expected for a 7 joule movement. Anyway, it's unlikely the movement went through any serious positional adjustment when it was first built. The project nears completion as I install this beautiful glass crystal that has a nice thick bevel. In today's consumer world, where we want everything fresh and new, and I admit it's a world I'm guilty of participating in, it feels really good to take a watch that was way past its usable life and put it back into service for another, I don't know, 100 years. So that's pretty much it. Let me know if you stuck with me till the end of this video. I had a lot of fun making it, and it was one of my more challenging projects I have filmed. There were times during this project I felt like I was swimming in the deep end of the pool. So I hope you found this interesting and perhaps learned something from this video today, and if not I hope you at least found it enjoyable. Thanks for fixing watches with me today, and I'll see you in the next one.